Hello, Craig. Thank you very much for meeting me, even if it's through a screen and on the other side of the planet. Uh, so just a quick review of your career for the Metal Express Radio uh, people. You're one of the greatest guitarists of the 20th century. You were a Dio's guitarist on excellent albums. So Magica, Dream Evil, which is a personal favorite, and also Master of the Moon. Um, so the first question will be, how are you? If that's okay to say, you mentioned to me before the interview, you had an injury, so I hope you're feeling better. Oh, I am little by little, yes. It's just one of those, it's, a, it was, I live in an area that's really, um, in, in many aspects, it's great because it's right across the street from the hospital, right across the street from a grocery store, a bank, uh, a restaurant. However, that makes, for some reason, people crazy. So there's always somebody not looking and racing around and for some reason, good old hit and run, you know, you get hit and then you get out of your car. I mean, all of my, all of my, um, I, I didn't even know that they had side window airbags. Okay. So I, I, yeah, I got, I'm facing sideways now towards the curb. Uh, if the, if the street was north and south, I'm facing west <laughs> right and i'm trying to figure out okay how am i going to get out of this situation because i can't even see past the 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 the, uh, the driver's side and the passenger side um airbags so i had to lift them up by hand and then back out just to get, just to get out of harm's way it was very it was a very interesting uh, set of details and uh, luckily, the insurance company found me not at fault because they couldn't find anybody else on the scene or any, and nobody wanted to come forward as a as a witness. So, but um, little things are getting better. Uh, but I, everything happens for a reason. A lot of times, when things like this happen, uh, it's usually a time of reflection for me. So if my, if there's something I cannot do physically, uh, I end up doing something mentally. Okay. And so uh, a lot of lyrics and a lot of things have, has, have accumulated. So it's not, you know, compl a complete waste of time. That's okay. Can you still play? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, okay. That's, that's the important part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so besides this, um, this, this horrible accident, um, the world, of, especially the world of culture, these last two years uh, had faced immense difficulty uh, due to the pandemic, of course. So how has it affected you as a musician? And any thoughts on the situation of musicians today and also uh, the technicians and the, and the crews taking care of the bands? That's a good question because um, it brings out the worst and the best of us. And that's the part that I see when it comes to crew members or if it comes to a record company or if it comes to bands, you know, they all know how to work together. They, they, I mean, if they don't know how to do it by now, then they shouldn't be in a band together because if they were in a band before the pandemic, then they know what to do. If this is their first band, it's going to throw them way off because it's, they're going to have to rely on some, on some, um, intuition that they may not necessarily even know they had nor uh, ever thought they'd ever rely on if you know what i mean by that because some the bands that existed before the pandemic already had a working relationship with one another with the crew and the lighting directors and they had fans and things like that and so there was a great loss but they didn't have to rely on there wasn't much self-reliance as far as like almost being stranded in the desert with only one bottle of water, <laughs> you know, this pandemic, if you haven't been in a band before this pandemic hit, it's very much like being stranded on a desert island with just one single bottle of water and how are you going to get, you know, how are you going to get through it? And, and the ingenuity in the, in the human spirit is, is absolutely an, an, an amazing and wondrous thing. But at the same time, it can also be so selfish and so self-serving 
that, that it's almost shameful. So it's brought out both, and, and I find that interesting. I'm hoping that the balance will give way towards the good, because uh, I understand why people are, are so self preser you know, everything's about self-preservation right now. Uh, but at the same time, there's, a, there's, there's all sorts of groups and people getting together, trying to help one another, you know, so it's a combination of everything. It's, it's like no other time. And uh, I lost my stepfather and my mother during this time. So it was kind of weird, you know, to, to um, the last six years I was taking care of them, really. And um, so when they were gone, it was, it was just uh, a completely different world. Everything that I had ever knew and, and depended on and relied upon was suddenly, suddenly disappeared. It's all coming back little by little. But at the same time, I just got off the phone with, with a guy who just, it's like some people are so, so stubborn about vaccines. I mean, when this first thing, when this thing first hit, we were crying out for a vaccine. And now there's certain people, I understand that their job, you know, that they're either, <laughs> they don't get a vaccine, they may lose their job. You know, and that's 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 a difficult situation to face. But at the same time, they don't see the bigger picture. You know, and and how that affects music is that this is a this is a social and economic change. Um, the last time something like this happened was like Desert Storm, and so the the whole world um, it was a nationwide. Um, recession there was all sorts of things that happened as a result of that and it changed music changed the musical appetite so that's going to happen soon the the, the musical appetite is going to change soon and why it changes and where it's going to go is going to be very interesting uh, but I, I, it seems to be all predicated on this sort of self-preservation I know I keep saying that, but um, that's just what I, I, I over here. Maybe it's just because I live in San Diego. Maybe that's just the way it is here in San Diego. But from what I see on the news, it doesn't seem to be any different. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think probably because music is it's also something very personal uh, with this very successive lockdowns and people being stuck in their home, a person maybe it's personal but when i was in lockdown i probably never listened to as much music as i did in that moment because i had time to do so and also it was a way to sort of compensate the fact that social life was yeah at a dead point that's so you good, had that's a good way to put it that's well that's a good light to shine on thank you that's a very yeah. nice light to shine upon that yes very very well said because that is uh, true it's there too yes so my ne next question would be maybe we'll won't talk about the pandemic until a little further. Um, I wanted to ask you about your projects, and most of all, I think it seems in all of your interviews and what you did the past years, you are extremely dedicated to um, keeping alive what I would call Dio spirit. Uh, you were with Dio's dis disciples, and you also did the shows uh, with Dio's hologram. Uh, do you have anything new with this project? And did you think about something else about Dio during the pandemic? Uh, well, actually, um, there was some talk about maybe doing some more Dio Disciples uh, concerts, but that also depends on how the injuries, you know, um, come to pass. But there's lots of other guitar players. I'm kind of hoping to see, because Rowan Robertson did some uh, Dio Disciples concerts. Um, and I wasn't able to, and he did great, and the fans seemed to love it. Doug Aldridge is a great favorite. Tracy G is a great favorite. They've got four other guitar players to choose from until you know I get my my act together. And it's not like I'm li if life threatening or anything, but I would like to take my you know if I am, and I don't want to hurry back just to you know just to jump into a situation that's sometimes those those things can be. Um, 
not necessarily thrown in the wrong hands, <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, it's a very touchy subject. Let's put it that way, and that's why the Dream Child came out. That I don't know if you remember that album or not with Rudy Sarzo. Yes, and, I had a question for it later, but you can talk oh, okay. about it now. <laughs> we'll we'll get into that then, you know. But it's um, and I did two songs of my own um, almost ten years ago. Um, I think it's still on iTunes. I think it's just Craig Goldie's personal tribute to Ronnie James Dio. There's two songs. One's called Hole in My Heart. One's called Dark Rainbow. And because I wanted to do my own tribute to Ronnie. Not that the Dio Disciples was anything horrible or anything like that. But there was just so much turmoil um, surrounding that band. You know, that... My favorite thing, and the only reason why I toured with that band, number one, was after the concert. To jump out there in the audience and talk to Ronnie's fans and give them a hug, because they were hurting. You know, especially 10 years ago, 11 years ago when it first started. I mean, they were just hurting, and I got a chance to, to form a bond with them, because when Ronnie was still with us, that was my favorite part about being in Dio was afterwards, you know, Ronnie and I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it now. Ronnie and I would, would, would go together, you know, cause all the other people are looking for girls or parties or whatever, you know, and that, and God bless them. That's great if that's what they want to do. But Ronnie and I would zero in on the weirdos, you know, there'd be, there'd be plenty of, you know, women that look like, you know, playboy centerfolds, but we'd walk right past them. And we go straight to, you know, the people who were always tossed aside, you know. Uh, I hate to use these terms, but the short, fat, ugly people, you know, that, that never got it, that never get noticed when there's a Playboy centerfold standing in the middle of the room, half naked. All the men always, you know, want to get her and drink and can I get you something? Can I do something for you? And all the other people get tossed aside. Well, me and Ronnie would go straight to the people who got tossed aside, and we had a ball because we would give them hugs and kisses and make the these, you know, what the world would call an ugly girl. We would make them feel so beautiful, you know, because they were, you know, they because we could see inside them, you know, and we could look in their eyes and hold their faces with our hands and give them kisses on their cheeks and give them kisses on their foreheads. You know, and make them feel like little princesses, you know. And it was beautiful. And then we would go outside and, and we would do all the the, uh, the autograph, all the autographs and everything that, that was necessary. And half the time, we wouldn't even get back to the hotel until about 3 o'clock in the morning. And we'd have a 6 a.m. lobby call to go on the bus and go to the next city. We would have very little sleep. But it didn't matter because we had so much fun. And so when we lost Ronnie, I wanted to make sure that that never went away. You know, Ronnie's music is never going to be forgotten. But I didn't want that special love that was in his heart, the way he, the way he made people feel special. He went out of his way to make people feel special. I didn't want that to ever die with him. And so that's my favorite part about Dio Disciples touring. And, um, and that's... The only reason why I do it. Okay, that, that's extremely novel, and it's it's great stories to to hear that um, all about Dio. And I'm since I'm still rather young. I was uh, only 14 when he died. Uh, I never got the chance to see uh, Dio's live. Uh, neither did my mother, who was the big, probably one of the biggest fan of Dio, and. It's something we really regret now. Um, but you also uh, did some shows with a hologram, and I think the public opinion was quite divided about it. Can you tell me something about uh, this hologram ID? Yeah, unfortunately, the hologram wasn't... The first one was quite good, I thought, the one with that had We Rock, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a thing called motion capture. Have you ever... You, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> Well, the person who did the motion capture for that song did a fantastic job. The person who did the motion capture for the rest of them, it just made it look like, you know, Howard Stern was practicing his his swimming lessons, you know, in on dry land. 
It just didn't look good. And it wasn't a good representation of Ronnie either. And so that was embarrassing. But at the same time, um, it was good enough for history to be made. For the very first time, I could look out in the crowd and I could see three generations of Dio fans. I'd see an old man with, with gray hair, with his hands on the shoulder of his son, who was probably about my age, with the hands on the shoulders of his son, who was probably about between nine, 12 and nine. And he was looking at the stage like, you know, PlayStation has come alive, you know. Wow, it's like a video game with a rock band, but live. So all three generations were there for different reasons, but all three generations were there watching the same band. And for those people who didn't have a chance to um, experience what Ronnie was like on stage, they didn't really get the greatest representation. However, when Ronnie sang... What he he was so expressive that you'd feel it. So, if he sang about things that angered him, chances are it angered you. <laughs> if he sang about things that saddened him, chances are a tear would come to your eye. If it made him laugh, chances are you'd be giggling to yourselves. That kind of thing. So you kind of knew him just because of the way he wrote and sang with such intensity and such inflections. He gave it his all. He created a whole world where all were welcome without boundaries. The only boundaries that were there were the ones that we created ourselves. And as long as we were good to one another, it didn't matter um, what the song was about or, or who was the guitar player or who was the bass player. It was because Ronnie James Dio was there. I mean, it was his voice. That's what that's what the thing was all about, is that I never got a chance to really see the hologram as much as the audience did because it was behind me. But what I did hear was his voice. And there were so many times it would it would just bring, I would almost bring tears, you know, tears to my throat and my eyes because the way he sang, you know, I could still hear, you know, the pain when he would sing about something that brought him pain. You'd hear it in his voice. And it could bring you to pain. I'm almost there now. <laughs> you know, it's just so expressive. Music to me is the ultimate expression. You know, a conversation you're having with a listener inside of a musical environment. And if it's done right, it can be the most intimate yet vulnerable situation you could ever experience with another person. And Ronnie had that down to a science. So whether you met him or you've seen him before, as long as you've heard his music, you knew him some way, shape or form. This uh, In July this year, uh, Dio's biography was published, uh, A Rainbow in the Dark. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So have you read it or have you participated in the publication uh, in any way? Well, I, I got a, a, a nice little um, a present from Wendy, a little inscribed um, copy sent to me. Yeah. And it stops. I'm wondering if they're going to add a little bit to it because it stops a little early. But it stops in my era, which is kind of nice because at the time, the last thing that Ronnie says in that book is nothing can stop us now. And that's how he felt when, when um, him and I were such good friends and we had such a great um, relationship and we had a, a very similar work ethic. And I think that's what he meant by that, is that um, if you wanted the easy way out, he would be a difficult person to work with. If you wanted to just do a couple hours a day, he'd be a very difficult person to work with. But if you loved the work and you would stay until it was done and you wouldn't even notice the time go by, he's the, the greatest man in the world to work with. There are so many times where we would have, 
who he, he would have these Christmas parties at his house. And he'd come over to me and go, Goldie, Goldie, come here. I want to show you something. And we'd run downstairs real quick. It was just to hear the one little idea. That's all it was. And the next thing we knew, five minutes went by, and we are going, okay, we better go back upstairs. The whole house was dark. My guests were asleep on the couch, and the entire party was over because we had so much fun working together. And so that made me feel good to hear, you know, those last words because I think that was the very last thing he said in that in that book and it made me feel good that that's at one point how he made me feel um, there was times when you could you know he was the voice of the downtrodden he was the voice of the, of the black sheep of the globe he would give you inspiration when you were hurting he could lift you up you know, and make you give you hope when you had no when you had no hope that you could see, but he could fill your heart with hope. He he could make you feel important when you felt the least important. He could make you feel loved when you feel hated. You know, and so for that one moment, it seemed like I was able to kind of give back a little bit what he gave back to me. So that was very important to me that that bit there. Okay, um, I have to ask, what is your best memory with Dio, the best concert you did with him? <laughs> wow, that's that's hard to answer because that'd be like me asking you to choose out of these two. Just play along for now. Okay. I won't do it to you, but I'll, I'll answer your question. But out of these two, and you can only pick one, which would you rather do, inhale or exhale? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but there was there was so many there was so many great moments um a lot of times when me and ronnie first met uh, it had to do with his lyrics because i told him how much his lyrics meant to me and 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 we 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 got we became friends just right off that so once in a while he would run over to me <laughs> and with this panicked look on his face but his back was to the crowd you know and he, he'd say what's the lyrics to the second verse you know he'd whisper you know the lever of life oh yeah you know you would think he'd know he wrote the damn song himself but it was just cute to see him just kind of all of a sudden go oh, where am i you know because <laughs> we all get it we all have those little blank spots you know but to see him reach a blank spot and then come to me for the answer was was really nice those are some of my favorite um, things but my favorite of all tell me, stop me if you've ever heard this story it's called the um the the tuna fish sandwich story have you ever heard this i don't think so <laughs> okay well when before i met ronnie james dio i grew up in a very abusive home i was in and out of the out of hospitals stitches um I was thrown face first into a windowsill and left to bleed out for 45 minutes. Um, face shoved into the toilet while held underwater. Um, beatings, I mean, just crazy. So I, I bought a car that I was too young to own and a friend of mine's father gave me a job that I was too young to have. I had a wind up clock so I could support myself while I lived on the streets. And then, um, um a friend of mine perry mccarty he was a, a really strong singer he got an audition to go up to sing for a band called warrior and he got the gig and he felt bad for leaving me behind and i still feel sad when i when i say about how when we lost randy rhodes you know that's sad because it just is and and jakey lee from rough cut took his place well well Ronnie James Dio was the producer of Rough Cut. So now they had um, an opening for the guitar slot for Rough Cut. They could have taken anybody from LA. They had the, everybody had the stage clothes, they had the, the following, they had the hair, the, the, they had the equipment. Anybody could have walked in and done that. But that tape that I gave to my friend Perry, who felt bad for leaving me behind, ended up being in a band called Warrior who was friends with Rough Cut. 
So Ronnie got a hold of my demo and he says, we got to bring this kid up here. But how do you find a kid who lives in his car? So they found me, brought me up there for the audition, um, rented gear for me. Uh, I didn't even have an amp or anything. Uh, he got inspired during the audition. We sang Heaven and Hell and Men on the Silver Mountain together, which is where that whole, what's the lyrics to the second verse? You know, the lover of life. Oh, right, right. I'm the day, I'm the day. Oh, yeah. It happened on that night, too. The very first night we met. After that, it was just the two of us sitting at his house, talking, watching old rainbow videos. We became friends. And then because I was homeless prior to that, I would be living on the band members' couches week from week. You know, one week would be the drummer's couch. One week would be the bass player's couch and so forth and so on. So I was a, in, in, a, in an apartment and I bought myself a can of tuna. And I made myself a tuna fish sandwich. And that person came home and threw a fit because they thought that I had stolen their can of tuna and made a tuna fish sandwich. I'm like, dude, how much can a can of tuna cost? You know, I'll buy you a can of tuna. But that fit was heard around the world. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a single word. I just thought it was so ridiculous. But the next day, I look out the window, and I could swore I saw Ronnie's car pull up. And sure enough, there was Ronnie and Wendy getting out of the car. They both had two full bags of groceries in their arms. And they walked up the, they walked up the stairs and kicked the door because they didn't have a free arm to knock. I opened up the door. They stormed in. They slammed all four grocery bags down on the table. And they say, these are for Craig. Leave them alone. And they stormed out as fast as they stormed in. They stopped the Holy Diver recordings so that they could go shop and buy four bags worth of particular items to hand deliver to me over a can of tuna for me. Okay, no, I've never heard this story before. It's uh, it's incredible. <laughs> I, I'm really, yeah, so I had a question for later, but I might as well ask it now um, about how you learned to play, um, because obviously now with the Internet um, and the music industry, it seems really easier to to learn music uh, on online. There are tons of app tabs and sheets available, YouTube channels, online classes and how did you learn to play and what are your thoughts on how it's easier maybe to learn music today if it is easier and what do you what do you feel about it that's a good question um in many ways i'm grateful for how much easier it is for other people i enjoyed the work i used to listen to uh, records on vinyl so i would actually have to lift the needle up and start over again to try and listen to the part I'm learning, pick the needle back up, put it back a little bit further. So I, I went through a few different vinyl records after that until I got smart enough to just record it onto a cassette tape, then hit stop, rewind, play, stop, rewind, play in order for me to learn the song. So I learned it the hard way. And um, to me, that's, you know, that's great. There was a lot of people who could slow stuff down. Uh, one friend of mine, I mean, his his father was so rich, he had this stuff where he could, he had a computer program way back in 1982, 81. I forget when the first, when, um, I think it was maybe 70 something when um, Eruption came out and his father bought, it, bought him this uh, computer program that would slow it down to an exact octave below so he could learn eruption note for note with ease and i thought wow that's amazing however when he played it it was note for note but there was that was it um i see a lot of kids on the on youtube playing like richie blackmore solos note for note but there's no feeling there um 
However, I do hear some very gifted people out there with loads of feeling. You know, those are the people I'm happy for who have it easier, who are loaded with a gift, who know how to portray a solo. Because a, a Richie Blackmore solo was like trying to quote Shakespeare. You know, you have to have feeling. You know, it, it sounds it sounds kind of stupid for a man to hear this, but, you know, you might understand it more because, um, you know, women can feel a little bit more. They're, they're in touch with their feelings more. Richie Blackmore has a tender side to him, a romantic side to him. He has beauty. He has romance. He has anger. He has um, uh, blues. He has... Um, explosions of of oddities that come out of nowhere but all of those things combined is what make Richie Blackmore who he really is so if you don't know how to be tender if you don't have if you don't know how to look your girlfriend in the eye you know and hold her tenderly but at the same time with strength you know then you've got no business trying to play a Richie Blackmore solo because you have to have both inside you. Because if you don't, you're just going to play the notes. And it's not just about the notes. It's the interpretation, too. I think you're really right. And also, uh, there's something, maybe it's personal thought as well, on the way people consume music today. Because, uh, you no, know, you just log on Spotify or Deezer and you have everything you want, almost. And... <laughs> when before, um, my mother ta taught me how to like music and how to enjoy it and that and not take it for granted uh, because she remembers and she tells me how she had to purchase uh, the vinyls, the records and how it was difficult to find in the middle of the French countryside. Uh, just yeah, uh, so, when she had to yeah. listen on the radio uh, basically at 2 a.m. if she wanted to hear just the beginning of Holly Diver, uh, because there was uh, only one radio show that used DS music in the whole country. And maybe um, it's an expression that I sometimes use, isn't that songs right now, like tissues, you listen to it once or twice and then you throw it away. And I have an impression that in the 80s, in I would say the golden age of ever metal, it was really different. And what are your thoughts on how music is consumed today? Do you have like um, streaming services or do you still purchase your records or your vinyls at the local store? Well I still prefer to purchase because I think it's wrong. I think I, I understand about streaming. I get it. Um, but I think it's a form of stealing. Not that this is why I say that. Um, for one thing like I told you before, I learned most of my stuff off vinyl. Um, then I bought the cassette. Then I bought the the A track. Then I got the CD. You know, then the download. And then so when like if I'm going to work with Joe Lynn Turner, I know I'm going to be doing some Deep Purple and some Rainbow songs. So sometimes I don't have all of my library at my fingertips so i don't feel so bad going on youtube and listening to it for free because i already bought the damn stuff four times <laughs> you know but um like a movie when it comes out it has an opportunity to hit the theaters uh and then maybe on demand then hbo and then netflix and then it starts streaming even nowadays there's still some theater releases you know yeah. But music uh, nowadays, I mean, it's 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 heartbreaking because, you know, for a guy like me, I was I was a side man. You know, I was just paid um, a weekly salary, um, so I never got a chance to get the lion's share of the T-shirts and the record sales and stuff like that. So when I finally worked myself up to a um, and earned my you know my my stripes to 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 earn the lion's share. There was no such thing because people were stealing it and <laughs> never it, it it just went straight to streaming. And there was maybe some downloads and stuff like that. Now, I understand because what happened was a lot of musicians were 
putting out CDs that only had two or three good songs. So people got tired of that. Okay. Sure that sound is. okay, I'm sorry, the, the last part cut. So, sure um, that sound was, it sounded like a plane went over. Anyways, a lot of people, uh, a lot of musicians, um, there was a time during Desert Storm when uh, we had a nationwide um, recession and then Michael Jackson demanded a billion dollar advance and got it and Madonna um, demanded a billion dollar advance and got it but they didn't recoup so we had a recession within a recession so all the record companies had to tighten their belts so all the big bands that were used to getting five hundred thousand dollars for their albums weren't getting that anymore so they were very very um, um, they had hatred for the pop music artists who changed their lives so drastically like that because they were so selfish and so they started working less and so all of a sudden people are buying you know CDs for $15 a pop and they're only getting three good songs so that also uh, started you know, you know people wanting to you know like well, well screw this you know thank God for iTunes I can go in and just buy one or two songs now streaming you know the spotify it's like i get these people saying hey dude i'm listening to you on spotify you guys rock i'm like i feel like saying well thank you for the point zero 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 three percent of a penny you know it's not about the the money it's about money being a tool because remember we talked way back about how we treated the fans and ronnie and my tuna fish sandwich story you know well wouldn't it be nice to have money and a heart like that that's what money's for i remember ronnie handed me an envelope once and i didn't know what it was and he gave me an address and he said can you go deliver this for me please and i did and i came back and i found out that it was ronnie had paid the rent of a fan that was having trouble I'm covering their rent that month. Things like that, you know, money is a tool. And so now it's almost pointless, you know, to do a great record because for what? It's, you know, so you can pat yourself on the back and say, what a, you know, great job, well done. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, I hope I can pay my rent. You know, that's really sad. That's really, really sad that people have decided to steal from us. You know, hopefully a balance will be restored, you know, because now bands are charging too much for tickets. They're doing all these paid meet and greets. You got to buy a T-shirt or a, or, a, or a CD before they'll even sign a photograph. And it's just we need to restore balance because back in the 80s, there was a great balance between band and fans, you know, and we need to restore balance again because otherwise there's going to be no point for people to create new music because I, I hate to say it because there's no money in it i mean isn't that sad no, yeah i think it's it's really sad i think you're right um especially that now uh they bands only win earn some money because they are touring relentlessly some bands they do hundreds yeah. thousands of shows some just where they know the money will be and smaller concerts yep. are not really a thing now. There are huge festivals and with the pandemic, small shows or festivals, all of them were impossible. Yeah. But this last couple of months, well, in France at least, in the US maybe it's different, stages are slowly recovering slowly really slowly recovering from the pandemic and some shows small shows are happening again some are still cancelled um, maybe we're on the right path we don't really know um what do you think of this um evolutions of concerts now well you're i, I agree with you is is, is that um we i just got to go back to my original statement is that i just pray that balance is restored because 
fans deserve to have amazing music. You know, that that's part of why they started streaming was because bands gave up and they started, you know, forcing you to pay. A, you, you know, you couldn't you couldn't buy just a single song before you had to buy the whole CD. Then once you bought the whole CD and you spent fifteen dollars, you only got three good songs. It's like, what the hell is this all about? And that went on for years. So I get it. But we got to have we have to rewind. We have to go back to when integrity you know, we just have to, we got a band together, you know, sorry for the pun, <laughs> you know, but we got to get guys who care again, guys who know, you know, there's, the internet can do whatever it wants. It can change the world as much as it wants. Streaming can steal as much as it wants, but I'll tell you one thing, the process that's involved in reaching people's hearts, piercing their very soul, to the point where you can change their life, that process will always be the same. I have an anecdote for you. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Great Britain in a supermarket, and I see a girl probably about my age, and she was re wearing a rainbow t-shirt, Rainbow Rising. Ah. It was really cool, super t-shirt. So I said, so I talked to her and I said, yeah, your t-shirt is really cool. Uh, what's your favorite song on the album? I really love Stargazers. And she looked at me and to my great dismay, I quickly realized she had probably never heard a Rainbow song. Because <laughs> apparently <laughs> um, rock band's t-shirts are fashionable now. Um, with this, oh. I kind of fear. <laughs> I kind of fear for the legacy of rock and roll. And do you have any fear? Oh my yeah. God! So now they're just buying shirts because they look good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then they don't even know what songs are on the album. That's interesting. I never heard that story before. Well, yeah. maybe you've seen that the Kardashians or something are are wearing Metallica's T-shirt or <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah fashion statements it's you know but uh, yeah you're right you're right you're right sometimes it's you know it but I think it comes in seasons you know I, I think that people are going to get tired of it eventually they're going to get tired of the easy way they don't know it yet because like you were saying you know it is a lot easier to learn music but it's not easy to write the kind of music that's going to pierce your heart. Some people can do it accidentally because they're just naturally gifted. Those are the people that I care about the most because I want to be able to help them. I want to be able to pass on what I have learned from Ronnie, you know, and all the things that he did for me. Because there was a time when he looked at me and he said, Goldie, I want to pass the torch on to you, kid. And that meant everything to me, you know, and so I'm just now learning, you know, what that fully meant, you know, some of the lyrics and melody lines and chord structures and song structures that I'm now coming up with are completely different. You know, Dream Child was pretty close and my first solo album, Hidden in Plain Sight, was pretty close. Um, it's just now coming to fruition, you know, and I'm getting older and I'm, I'm gonna, I want to find some people that I can pass this on to because it's a great gift. It's a great craft. You know, to, to be able to sit down and create something that pierces somebody's heart that can either make them laugh or cry or, or jump for joy or run and hide. You know, it's just because you happen to sit down and decided to be the best you could possibly be at your particular craft. I mean, that's that should be that should never be something that people steal. That should never be. But, you know, like I said, it comes in seasons. So I think, you know, just like people got tired of, you know, the 80s came back around, you know, it's probably going to it's probably going to disappear again. But eventually, you know, at least maybe people will start starving for good. And maybe the, you know, and maybe the, the, you know, after the pandemic, you know, people will start making money again and they'll start being a little more, you know, a little more picky about where they purchase their music because maybe they're going to maybe they're going to get tired of hearing the same old crap on Spotify I'm going to say Spitify really on um, you know and all the streaming you know I mean God bless them God bless them you know because they're they're just they're 
they're trying to survive just like we are. But, you know, let, let's just be honest. You're, they're stealing. It's theft. So at some point, I think people are going to understand the cost that's involved, what they've actually taken from the universe, from the earth. You know, there's 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 a there's a there's a, an amount of joy that only a real artist can give that cannot be replaced by digital barfing. You know, and and once people get tired of digital barfing, they're going to start realizing that I really need I need something that that can, you know, like you know what it's like when you've had a bad day. You know exactly what song you're going to go home and listen to, don't you? Exactly. You know yes. what song <laughs> you know what song you're going to put on in your car on your way home. You know it, but pe- people don't. People are going to, you know, those those days are coming back again when people are going to go, you know, because those songs are like friends. They're, they're, a band, when, when a band does its job, it's creating an invisible friendship with people all around the world that they have yet to meet. That's the beautiful part about it, is that they're creating invisible friendships because it's music is a conversation or a story that you're telling within a musical environment. And how do people make friends? They make friends by talking to each other, by sharing ideas and having the same things in common. So if these stories in these songs have things in common with people all around the world, eventually these people are gonna go, wow, have you, did you hear this song? Did you hear this? I mean, oh my God, it made, you know, this is amazing. And maybe it'll happen all over again. Maybe it has to start from scratch, you know, but. I'm an eternal optimist, so I hope that it happens, you know, before I get a chance to pass, you know, whatever it is that I'm holding on to. I need, I would really like to pass that on. Yes. Yeah. These are beautiful thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, now, yeah, back to you on projects. Uh, we mentioned Dream Child earlier. Uh, Dream Child published Until Death Do We Meet Again in 2018. Uh, so. Do we have anything new to expect for Christmas or next year with Dream Child? Uh, well, that's a good question because there's some, you know, there's some business matters. Once again, you know, people, people, uh, people get in the way. Business can get in the way. But I do know that at some point I'll be doing another album with with uh, that singer. I'll tell you that much. Him and I, he's, he's one of the best singers in the world. So if it's not another Dream Child album, it will be an album with him. There seems to be like a loud noise coming from time to time. Are you like... Um, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm living next to a train station. So it's oh. a bit like in... Um, <laughs> you, you know the movie The Blues Brothers when they live near... The... <laughs> It's the same. I can't really do anything about it. Sorry. No, now we can laugh about it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Before I was like going, what am I doing wrong? What did I do? No, it's nothing. It's it's just the train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but but yeah, yeah, there'll be another album specifically with Diego Valdez. Yeah. I'll yeah. never forget that. That was about 11 years ago. A friend of his from Argentina, he, he came from Argentina. A friend of his sent me an MP3 of a Dio cover of a song that Ronnie and I wrote called Push. Yeah. And it was from a band called Helker. And it was chilling. I heard it sounded like Ronnie had covered his own song. I thought, this is this can't be true. This can't be true. So I got a hold of him and I asked him, how do I get a hold of your friend? You know, and tell him how amazing he is. And he said, oh, well, his name is... Diego and I'll, I'll hook you guys up. And so I told him how great he was 11 years ago, <laughs> you know, and I said, it's too early, but someday you and I are going to do an album together. And sure enough, we got that happened. It was a great story too, because we were on, I was on the, on the, on the phone with Serafino, the president of, of Frontiers. We were talking about something else and we happened to be on the subject of, you know, when, whenever I have to go on YouTube, I see the same old comments about Deep Purple and Rainbow saying they don't make music like that anymore. 
And he, he goes, well, can you? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. He goes, can you get me Rudy Sarzo? I said, yeah. And luckily, Rudy was interested and available. And he goes, can you get me Simon Wright? I said, well, yeah. Luckily, Simon was available. And he goes, who would you write with? And so me and this keyboard player, Wayne Findlay, he's the second guitar player and keyboardist for Michael Shanker. He lives in San Diego, California, where I live. And he and I were trying to put a band together similar to that. And we, him and I write really well together. And then Doogie White from Rainbow, him and I, I write together really well. Jeff Pilson from Foreigner and Doc and him and I write really well together. Um, uh, Chaz West uh, from Resurrection Kings, him and I write really well together. Alessandro Del Vecchio, we write really well together. So we have the writing down. And so um, he goes, who would you have sing? So I said, I'm going to send you an MP3. <laughs> and there was a contract in my inbox the very next morning because it had to be Diego. <laughs> yeah, it isn't, isn't an incredible singer. Uh, since it was quite recent, um, I have a couple of questions about what you listen to these days. Um, have your tastes evolved? throughout your, your career or are you always going back to the classics are you pleased with young bands and could you basically share us your playlist <laughs> oh well that's interesting i mean there there are some new stuff that i like to listen to um uh, but i do like the classics and so i spend more time listening to classics and uh forget who a train i love that band trained there was a they did a um a concert on that was broadcast on television and i was lucky enough to dvr it and i know they're not exactly new and they're not exactly young but they're far removed from the kind of stuff i used to listen to until i heard them do some led zeppelin songs and i mean some of the stuff that they did was absolutely fantastic it blew my mind Uh, so, yeah, sorry, that's the train. <laughs> Funny, we were just talking about the band yeah. train. Mm. Uh, yeah, so there, the, I, I can't remember offhand. There's some, there's some new stuff that's actually really quite good, but I haven't like written it down and made it my playlist yet because I'm, I'm kind of. When I write, I kind of like to be left alone, so I don't accidentally you know, uh, get, uh, uh, you know, accidentally influenced by something that's already, that I've heard. And then, I, and then later on, it's like, oh, that sounds like, you know, so I'm in that mode right now. Okay. So you are writing songs right now. Uh, are you, do yes. you want to publish a, a solo album soon? Yeah, I, I might, I might, uh, uh, people keep asking me, I might do like a special, um, re-release of the hidden in plain sight album maybe but definitely maybe do a, a, a solo album but i like to collaborate so to me dream child was really like a solo album because it it, it really was given to me from serafino like hey this is your band do it you know and so most of the stuff i wrote but i didn't take credit for it because check this out i mean <laughs> uh, you know you know how it is like when somebody i'm sure you've heard of bands like guitar players will have a drum machine right mm -hmm. uh, and they can probably play bass and keyboards and they could probably get somebody to sing and so they can put songs together on their own right but imagine sending that song to simon wright Imagine sending that song to Rudy Sarzo. Imagine sending that song to Diego Valdez. And what you get back, if it's not the same song, then their names need to go on it too. Because what they, what they gave to that song wasn't there before. So I couldn't in good conscience put just my name on it, if you know what I mean. In fact, we had like a little joke, you know, that they would say, is that okay? I'd say, no. 
and they're like, I'd wait for that little moment where they'd be like worried. I go, no, it's, it's much better than we have a good laugh, you know? So in a way that was kind of like a solo album. I, 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 I like to shy away from solo albums because there's, I like to collaborate. And so solo albums are the least amount of collaboration. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for all these answers. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to conclude uh, this interview? Well, I would like to at least um, tell people, still dare to dream. You know, even the kids, you know, is that um, some people don't even allow themselves to dream because they're afraid to, to either you know, maybe they'll they'll fail or or maybe it won't work out the way they hope. Um, so they don't even allow themselves to dream. There's people out there that are so gifted and they don't even know it because they don't even allow themselves to work on their craft. So it stays like a skill. They don't even realize that the skill that they hold is it is wrapped in is a gift that's been wrapped inside of a skill they have to unwrap the gift to find it and get past the skill it's hard to explain um because dreaming seems so uh without promise without Dreaming seems to have a uh, very little um, absolute uh, response. It's it's intangible. For instance, if you think of something, you don't see that thought. And then if you decide on that thought, you don't see that decision. The third thing that happens is the first thing we see is your action. Your action is just the animated version of your thought process and what's going on in the unseen realm. The unseen realm runs everything. It's time we unleash the unseen realm. Stop making dreamers feel like shiftless, you know, irresponsible. You can be a very responsible. Dream. There's a lot of work involved. Leave no stone unturned. If, if a if if a pure heart makes a wish and leaves no stone unturned, something magical is going to happen. But the key is leave no stone unturned. Work, but allow yourself to dream. Be yourself. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I think you're right. Dreaming is important and. Dio, in many Dio songs, dreaming was really the key notion, I think. Um, yeah, dream evil, as they say, <laughs> to make good metal music. <laughs> so thank you very much, Craig Goldie. Uh, this was Severine Peraldino for Metal Express Radio. And thank you for tuning in. <laughs>